Thanksgiving is a time of year when people sit in reflection upon wonderful memories of days gone by. It is a time of rejoicing, of celebration, of reestablishing the bonds of friendship and family. It is the pinnacle of our autumnal consciousness. But it is also a time when the specters and phantoms of the past emerge to dance as vague shadows along the stones of the amber-lit hearth, to flit as tattered shades through the dark, crisp November air. Blackwater Media presents A Haunted Thanksgiving. As Americans gather for the Thanksgiving holiday, it is perhaps time to turn the clock back to one family feast that did not raise quite as much cheer. It tells of the terrible incidents that took place in a house in Oakville, Georgia, USA, in the latter part of the 19th century. This spot had earned a high place amongst haunted localities, and in its day was comparable with the famous house in Berkeley Square. Situated in the midst of picturesque but lonely country, this house, the property of a farmer named Walsingham, had a worldwide reputation amongst paranormal researchers. For some time the house had been left deserted by its owner, and it would seem that during the temporary absence of its material master it passed into the hands of beings or forces, call them what you will, who wished to remain in undisputed possession. When Walsingham and his family decided to return and take up their abode in the house, they were struck on the very first day by the peculiar feeling of the place. They could not decide in any way what this feeling was, but on analysis likened it to claustrophobia, an overpowering dread of being alone within any four walls. Their dog, Don Caesar, absolutely refused to enter the house. On being dragged in, he immediately broke out into furious barking, his back bristled with rage, and he showed every sign of terror. This occurred several times during the day, and the same evening, being attracted to the spot by his whines and howls, Walsingham saw his dog attacking some invisible enemy. Don Caesar at last sprang into the air, as if at a man's throat but fell back as if he had received a heavy blow. When picked up, his neck was found to be broken. The Walsingham's cat, on the other hand, manifested every sign of delight at being in the house. It strolled from room to room, purring loudly, and was seen on several occasions twisting its head from side to side and arching its back as if someone were stroking it. To say that the Walsinghams were amazed at these things would be to describe their feelings mildly. They were very much upset, but had not as yet any suspicion on the score of supernatural causes. But that evening, just towards dusk, the house was suddenly filled with shouts, groans, and hideous laughter, heard by all the occupants, and putting them into a veritable panic. Miss Amelia Walsingham, while sitting in front of her mirror, saw a man's hand upon her shoulder, yet there was no reflection of it in the glass, nor was there any arm or body apparent. Walsingham himself saw footprints forming in the dust of a garden path before him as he walked, yet no mortal could be seen. But though these things were uncanny and terrifying, and were sufficient to make the family realize that some force out of the usual was at work. They paled into insignificance before the later incidents which took place during the evening meal. The family was seated at supper with one or two guests when their conversation was suddenly interrupted by a loud and horrible groan uttered apparently in the room above. Little notice was taken of it until one of the guests pointed out a stain of what looked like blood on the tablecloth, and it was then seen that some liquid was slowly dripping from the ceiling overhead. 
This liquid was so much like freshly shed blood as to horrify those who witnessed its slow dripping. It would be hard to imagine a more gruesome occurrence at any time, but the peculiar form of this horror and the theatrical way in which it was carried out would put it down as the invention of some most evil-minded but decidedly clever person. It flashed into the minds of all sitting at the table that some terrible deed had been committed in the room above, some frightful murder. For a few seconds all sat silent with white faces, looking out of the corners of their eyes at each other in terror. Then Walsingham shook off the paralysis of fear and ran out of the room, followed by his son. They went quickly upstairs to the room over the dining room and flung open the door, dreading what fearful sight their eyes should meet. But it was empty. They tore up the carpet and there found the boards to be soaked with the same red, gruesome liquid as was dripping in the room beneath. But there was no explanation, nor was any afterwards discovered. The liquid was later examined under a microscope by a medical man and pronounced to be human blood. This incident was too much for the Walsinghams and they left the house and removed to another. Walsingham House then fell into entire disuse and stories of the occurrences being put abroad. The place was shunned by day as well as by night. This neglect did not tend to make the spot look more cheerful and it is stated that in addition to the gloom that generally settles on the most ordinary of empty houses, there was an undoubted feeling of depression in the air around the place. Quite normal people said that it felt to them as if the atmosphere of the locality weighed more than anywhere else. The house had not yet been approached for several months when a young man named Horace Gunn made it the subject of a wager betting a friend a fair sum of money that he would stay alone in the house for one night and have no aid within call. This enthusiastic young man carried out his intention and went to the house one evening before it was dark. His story is best told in his own words. I had been in the house about an hour and nothing had happened. It was just beginning to get dark and I thought I would set about lighting a fire. Though I do not consider myself an expert in this art, I was very much surprised at being absolutely unable to do so. My matches went out one after the other, as if blown out by a strong draft. Once when I succeeded in lighting a piece of paper, it only smoldered for a few seconds and then went out. This was bad enough, as I had to give up the idea of a cheerful blaze to keep me company but to my disgust I found that my lamp would not light either. It was as if it were filled with water instead of with oil. It was now quite dark and whilst I was looking about for some means of getting a light there came a terrible yell of pain from underneath the house and this was the signal for an outbreak of the most hideous and devilish noises. There were shouts, screams, groans, laughter, thumping, and the continual running up and down stairs as of several heavily shod people. My hair bristled. I stood by the window practically paralyzed with fear, and had I been then able to control my limbs, I would have fled from the house. I would have lost my wager and a hundred like it rather than stay in that haunt of fiends. Then suddenly the noises stopped complete silence fell on the place. But far from reassuring me, this made matters worse, for now I dreaded the silence even more than I had the ghostly noises. All the time I listened, listened for something. Now and then I thought I heard the soft footsteps drawing near me, but it was nothing. This waiting and dreading was far worse than the pandemonium of terror. I did not have long to wait for the next move, for in the darkness there suddenly appeared a small spot of grayish light on the wall opposite me. It grew larger and larger, altering in shape, until it assumed the outline of a human head, at the same time losing its flatness. Soon it was a real head, floating in the air. Its hair was long and gray and matted together, and it had a deep and jagged cut in one temple. 
The whole face indicated suffering and misery. The eyes were wide open and gleamed with an unearthly fire while they seemed to direct their gaze upon me. The head moved about the room, but always the eyes turned in my direction. Then it vanished, but there broke out in the room a loud and awe-inspiring wail as of several souls in anguish. I thought then that I could see indistinct shapes flitting about, and mustering up all my courage I attempted to pass them and gain the door, but just as I reached it I felt my ankle seized in a firm grasp. I was thrown down and felt fingers grasping at my throat. At this point Mr. Gunn's story ceases. He was found by his friends next morning, unconscious on the floor by the door, and bearing on his throat the marks of long, thin fingers with cruel, curved nails. After this experience, no one was found to have anything more to do at the house, though a few people interested in such matters attempted to find out some reason for this terrible haunting. Though several avenues of investigation were explored, nothing very conclusive was discovered. The house had by this time acquired such an evil reputation that no one would occupy it, and it was ultimately demolished. Many human bones were found under it and in its grounds. How they came there was never known, but it was supposed that they had lain there for many years and were the bones of people who might have been murdered when the house was a roadside inn of very bad repute. And herein perhaps lies an explanation for the hauntings at the house. A few days before returning to his house, Mr. Walsingham, having discovered in the ground some old, dried bones, and not able to decide whether they were human or not, settled the matter as he thought by ordering them to be thrown into a lime kiln. Is it possible that the spirits of the men whose bones were thus so indecently treated summoned to their aid certain dark forces in order to make the place uninhabitable by mortals in revenge for the insult offered to their remains? The answer may never be known. A laundress newly moved to Charleston following the Civil War found herself awakened at the stroke of twelve each night by the rumble of heavy wheels passing in the street. But she lived on a dead-end street and had no explanation for the noise. Her husband would not allow her to look out the window when she heard the sounds, telling her to leave well enough alone. Finally, she asked the woman who washed at the tub next to hers. The woman said, What you are hearing is the army of the dead. They are Confederate soldiers who died in hospital without knowing that the war was over. Each night they rise from their graves and go to reinforce General Lee in Virginia to strengthen the weakened Southern forces. The next night the laundress slipped out of bed to watch the army of the dead pass. She stood spellbound by the window as the gray fog rolled past. Within the fog, she could see the shapes of horses and could hear the gruff human voices and the rumble of cannons being dragged through the street, followed by the sound of marching feet. Foot soldiers, horsemen, ambulances, wagons, and cannons passed before her eyes, all shrouded in gray. After what seemed like hours, she heard the far-off bugle blast and then silence. When the laundress came out of her days, she found one of her arms was paralyzed. She has never done a full day's washing since. She commandeered the room in the basement of her dorm as soon as she realized she would have to pull an all-nighter in order to prepare for tomorrow's final exam. Her roommate, Jenna, liked to get to bed early, so she packed up everything she thought she would need and went downstairs to study, and study, and study some more. It was two o'clock when she realized that she left one of the textbooks upstairs on her bed. With a dramatic sigh, she rose and climbed the stairs slowly to her third floor dorm room. The lights were dim in the long hallway and the old boards creaked under her weary tread. 
She reached her room and turned the handle as softly as she could, pushing the door open just enough to slip inside so that the hall lights wouldn't wake her roommate. The room was filled with a strange metallic smell. She frowned a bit, her arms breaking out into chills. There was a strange feeling of malice in the room, as if a malevolent gaze were fixed upon her. It was a mind trick. The all-nighter was catching up with her. She could hear Jenna breathing on the far side of the room, a heavy sound, almost as if she had been running. Jenna must have picked up a cold during the last tense week before finals. She crept along the wall until she reached the bed, groping among the covers for the stray history textbook. In the silence, she could hear a steady drip, drip, drip sound. She sighed silently. Facilities would have to come to fix the sink in the bathroom. Again. Her fingers closed on the textbook. She picked it up softly and withdrew it from the room as silently as she could. Relieved to be out of the room, she hurried back downstairs, collapsed into an overstuffed chair and studied until six o'clock. She finally decided that enough was enough. If she slipped upstairs now, she could get a couple of hours sleep before her nine o'clock exam. The first of the sun's rays were beaming through the window as she slowly slid the door open, hoping not to awaken Jenna. Her nose was met by an earthy metallic smell a second before her eyes registered the scene in her dorm room. Jenna was spread eagle on top of her bed against the far wall, her throat cut from ear to ear and her nightdress stained with blood. Two drops of blood fell from the saturated blanket with a drip, drip noise that sounded like a leaky faucet. Scream after scream poured from her mouth, but she couldn't stop herself any more than she could cease wringing her hands. All along the hallway, doors slammed and footsteps came running down the passage. Within moments, other students had gathered in her doorway and one of her friends gripped her arm with a shaking hand and pointed a trembling finger toward the wall. Her eyes widened in shock at what she saw. Then she fainted into her friend's arms. On the wall above her bed, written in her roommate's blood, were the words, Aren't you glad you didn't turn on the light? There once was a monk at the mission who loved money and power more than he loved God. He would hear the confession of the good folk who attended the mission and then would blackmail them into giving him gold and silver to keep their darkest secrets. He turned many a wayward sinner's feet toward the fires of hell rather than the gates of heaven, encouraging their crimes in secret while he reviled them in public. It was after he beat one poor old woman to death that the evil monk was imprisoned and sentenced to hang for his crimes. But just after he was cut down from the noose and pronounced dead, his corpse began to transform before the horrified eyes of the people. The face twisted and small tusks sprang from either side of his nose. His shock of white hair grew long and greasy and two pointed canines emerged from his slit of a mouth. The goblin monk opened his eyes that glowed yellow even in the light of noonday and sprang to feet that now ended in claws rather than toes. The people screamed and fled and no prayer of his former brothers in faith could banish the goblin. It disappeared deep into the forest only to return at night and prey upon the monks of the mission who had been responsible for its death. After five of the brothers had fallen to the goblin, the rest of the monks abandoned the mission and moved to another part of the country. Since that time, the mission house has slowly fallen into ruin. Remember Harry, it's Marion's first holiday turkey, not a word if it's dry. It's her first turkey. It won't be juicy. 
What they don't know is Marion's first turkey is America's first turkey, Butterball. It's always juicy because it's specially deep-basted, so every slice is moist and tender. Mmm, juicy turkey, Marion. I knew it would be. After all, it's Butterball, also available fresh. We are Beatrice. The Hotel del Coronado in San Diego is one of the most beautiful hotels in the world, and some say the most haunted. The ghost story that has long been attached to the hotel is unique in that it's one of the only Thanksgiving ghost stories ever told. It involves a young woman named Kate Morgan who checked into the hotel on Thanksgiving Day, 1892, and never checked out. When the Hotel del Coronado opened in 1888, it was the largest resort hotel in the world. In the mid-1880s, the San Diego area was in the middle of a real estate boom. To draw people to the area, several wealthy businessmen went in together and built the Hotel del Coronado. The popularity of the hotel was established before the 1920s. It already had hosted Presidents Harrison, McKinley, Taft, and Wilson. The hotel went on to host presidents Franklin D. Roosevelt, Dwight D. Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, Lyndon B. Johnson, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, Reagan, Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama. By the 1920s, Hollywood stars and starlets discovered that the Dell was the in place to stay. Many celebrities made their way south to party during the era of Prohibition and used the Hotel Dell as their personal playground. Tom Mix, Rudolph Valentino, Charlie Chaplin, and Ramon Navarro were a few of the many actors who stayed at the hotel during weekend getaways. Other notables have included Marilyn Monroe, Thomas Edison, L. Frank Baum, Vincent Price, Babe Ruth, and many others. During World War II, the hotel was used to house Navy pilots and the families of officers. By the end of the war, the neglected hotel had started to age, and while millions were spent to refurbish it, a new owner in 1963 planned to tear it down. However, he changed his mind and remodeled and expanded it instead. It remains today as one of the most beautiful resorts on the West Coast, and one with several ghosts. The hotel's hauntings include the ghosts of a little boy and girl, a former hotel caretaker seen in the dining room, and a Victorian woman who has been seen dancing in the ballroom. But there are none as famous as the ghost of Kate Morgan. Kate Morgan, a pretty woman in her mid-twenties, checked into the Hotel del Coronado alone on Thursday, November 24, 1892. During her stay, hotel employees, many of whom had frequent interactions with Kate, reported that she appeared ill and very unhappy. She'd also told quite a few employees that she was waiting for her brother, who she said was a doctor, to join her, but he never showed up. Five days after she checked in, Kate was found dead on an exterior staircase leading to the beach. She had a gunshot wound to her head, which the San Diego County Coroner later determined was self-inflicted. A search of her hotel room revealed no personal belongings, in fact, there was nothing to identify the, quote, beautiful stranger, except the name she used when she registered, Lottie A. Bernard from Detroit. After her death, police sent a sketch of Kate's face and information about her death to newspapers and police stations around the country in the hopes that someone could shed light on the dark mystery surrounding the suicide of the unknown girl at the Coronado Hotel. Eventually, Lottie Bernard was identified as Kate Morgan originally from Iowa, and the wife of Tom Morgan. Reportedly, Tom Morgan was a gambler who may have made his living gambling on the railroad. After the inquest into Kate's suicide, a gentleman came forward to say that he had seen Kate arguing with a man, thought to have been Tom, on a train en route to San Diego. The witness said that Tom disembarked before reaching San Diego and Kate continued on to the Hotel del Coronado by herself, where it is assumed she waited for Tom to join her. When he never showed up, Kate took her own life. Since that time, paranormal activity has been reported in the room Kate stayed in during her 1892 visit, room 3327. There are many other types of paranormal manifestations in other areas of the hotel as well. 
Kate Morgan is the most enduring ghost of the Grand Hotel and continues her hold on the place more than 125 years after her tragic death. It was all over the papers, though no one really knew how the events unfolded. On the surface, it looked like the perfect Thanksgiving. The turkey was cooked to golden perfection. Steam still rose from the freshly baked dinner rolls and the house was filled with the scent of cinnamon and melted butter from the pumpkin pie and candied yams. Each family member sat around the table dressed in their Sunday best, ready to enjoy the feast before them. Yet this picturesque scene, which could have easily been on the cover of Home and Garden magazine, was revealed to be under the surface a gruesome tableau of a family fallen. Foul play was afoot this Thanksgiving. Five corpses sat around this untouched meal. Claude and Mildred Blackstone earned their money on the backs of hard-working slaves who ran their plantation. Claude ruled the farm with an iron hand during the day, and Mildred kept a household that was as strict as it was spotless. The two ice-cold children, which consisted of Braddy, Cynthia, and Toby, who earned a reputation for frequenting the slave quarters at odd hours of the night, had just reached young adulthood. The children occupied themselves with their own preoccupations, as did the rest of the Blackstone household. Uncle Percival, Claude's youngest brother, was generally considered to be a good man as the priest of the local parish of Farronville, but was not without his secrets. Claude had recently taken ill with tuberculosis, and it was clear he was not long for this world. <coughs> this had left Toby and Cynthia with a conundrum. They were the next of kin, and the fortune that they would stand to inherit was substantial. By the laws of the township, it was known that the entire fortune would go to Toby being the firstborn male son. This of course did not sit well with Cynthia as she soon began plotting to remove Toby from the picture. However, despite Toby's apparent thickness, he was wise to his sister's plans and developed his own. Cynthia's vanity would be her downfall. A simple tampering with her cosmetics would be the end for her but not before Cynthia's knowledge of her brother's sweet tooth would have him find an added ingredient in his beloved saltwater taffy. Both Blackstone children died silently in their sleep. Percival had always been jealous of Claude's success and affluence, but most of all, his wife. He had been in love with Mildred since they were children, but it was Claude who had won her heart and they married young. Yet the passion had faded from their marriage years ago, and now Percival found himself making more and more house calls to the Blackstone home. He and Mildred met in the woods to confront their secret love for each other, but religion and family obligation kept them from fully reconciling their passion, even despite Mildred's discovery of Claude's liaisons with the slaves. Percival would listen patiently as Mildred confessed her hate for her husband daily. Though he knew that Mildred was a woman scorned, she would never abandon her family. On the night before Thanksgiving, Percival came and met Claude in the kitchen just as he was leaving to rendezvous with the head housekeeper. Claude's breath was stinking of whiskey and Percival's patience was at an end. The hatred these two had for one another in this moment climaxed from a low simmer to a rolling boil and neither could suppress it any longer. Claude swung at his brother and missed, Percival reaching for the only thing he could find 
drove his crucifix directly through his brother's heart. In horror of what he'd done, Percival left the kitchen that Thanksgiving Eve and ran to his parish to pray. When Mildred came down for her nightly cup of tea and saw her husband dead on the floor, she quickly called for her children. When they didn't answer, she ran up to their room only to discover each child dead in their beds. Mildred screamed and wailed, crumbling to the floor in despair. However, moments later, as though nothing had happened, she rose, wiped her tears, and calmly dragged the bodies of her children one by one downstairs to the dining room. She gathered her husband's body from the kitchen. All night long she prepared them, dressing them in their finest clothes, cleaning their wounds, and arranging them around the table. Percival spent the night praying in the church, and that next morning came to the house ready to confront his sins and beg Mildred's forgiveness. As he reached the house, he called out for Mildred. He heard her familiar, elegant voice echo from the dining hall. In here! Percival entered. The table was set for all of them. The lifeless bodies sat around the Thanksgiving feast. A bottle rested between the two glasses of wine. Percival's shock and confusion left him speechless. All thoughts of his own confession to Mildred had left his mind. As he stammered to ask Mildred for an explanation, she smiled sweetly and handed him a glass of wine. Drink, she said, and we can all be family again. Percival drank the wine as he was told, and the poison worked quickly. Now, we are family again. I come from a very good upbringing. My family had it very good and I never really had to be without anything. I try to give back as much as possible. I donate a lot of money to the poor and things like that. One of the things that I'm the proudest of is that on Thanksgiving, I volunteer my entire day at a local homeless shelter. I try to make sure that these much less fortunate people have a good day as possible for them. I stay in the shelter overnight and leave the following morning. One of the sadder things about working in a shelter is seeing the same people there year after year. I mean, I guess seeing them makes me happy that they're not dead. But it would be nice if the majority of them were able to get themselves a place to live and not have to live on the streets anymore. The Thanksgiving 10 years ago is one that I'll never forget. There's not a lot of build up to the story, so I'll get right to it. The day and evening went as well as it could. There was this one guy that I'd never seen before. Normally, I wouldn't have even thought much about that. But he was very annoying and very rude. At one point, he even tried to take the food away from another man. Now, the rules of the shelter were that I was supposed to remove the man from the shelter for such an act. However, I couldn't bring myself to do that, not on Thanksgiving. I instead separated the two men and let the guy know that any further aggressive behavior would result in him being removed. The rest of the day and night went fine, as far as I was aware. However, at about three in the morning, one of the other homeless guys came into the office. He told me that one of the other men had been stabbed. I ran out into the area and sure enough, the man who nearly had his food stolen had been stabbed and he was dead. I turned on the lights and searched around for the rude guy from dinner and he wasn't there. I checked the bathroom and the window was open. He had killed the one man and then left as quietly as he could. The most horrific part of this was a man losing his life over something as simple as a dinner. Even worse for me was that the man would likely still be alive if I'd followed the rules and removed the man during dinner instead of letting him remain because it was Thanksgiving.
morning, every Kmart in America will open at 8 a.m. for a Thanksgiving sale. Check your Kmart circular. You'll find pages of great gift values for every person on your list. The nationwide Thanksgiving sale, tomorrow only, starting at 8 a.m. at the Kmart near you. A few years ago, I was at my parents' home for a family dinner on Thanksgiving Day. This is the house I grew up in and have never experienced anything paranormal. What happened to me that day was very surprising and still bothers me to this day. I spent the early part of the day helping my mother in the kitchen preparing dinner. We were laughing and talking and looking forward to sitting down to eat with the whole family. While making pumpkin pies, my mother needed a break from the heat of the kitchen and went into the living room to watch the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. I stayed in the kitchen and continued to work. While making the pies, I needed to go to the pantry to get some ingredients. The pantry is located down a short hallway connecting the kitchen with the back of the house. I grabbed the items I needed and headed back to the kitchen. I was almost back to the kitchen when I remembered that I forgot to grab something and quickly pivoted around to head back to the pantry. To my shock, there was a man standing near the area I just was in. It must have been two or three seconds, even though it felt like forever, and then he was gone. I've never seen this man before, but I can remember he was wearing overalls and a hat. The most disturbing thing for me was it seemed as though he reacted to me. It was like he was either shocked that I saw him or he was shocked to see me. After seeing this man, I decided not to tell my mother or father. It wasn't until months later I finally felt comfortable enough to tell my mom about it. She was interested but said she never had anything unusual happen to her in the 35 years she lived in the house. I know what I saw. I know he was there. My question is, why? Who is he? Why did I see him? In my 28 years of living and visiting my childhood home at Thanksgiving brought back so many great memories. But the two to three seconds on that Thanksgiving day seems to be burned into my mind more than anything else I've experienced in that house. On Thanksgiving Day 1902, a southbound train was nearing Geneva, New York, and came upon the Marsh Bridge. As the train approached the bridge, the engineer and fireman on board heard a piercing scream. When they looked up, they saw a white figure standing to the east of the bridge, frantically waving its arms. The engineer brought the train to a stop, and as he did so, they heard another scream and the phantom disappeared before their eyes. The two men got out of the train and inspected the track and surrounding area for the screaming weirdo they saw just moments before. Nothing was out of place on the track and there was no sign of any person or thing nearby. As they started across the bridge, they heard the shriek one final time. The train pulled into the station and as happens in such circumstances, the men shared their odd experience with the other railroad workers. They learned that there was an accident at that bridge years prior. The engineer and fireman both died when the train went off the Marsh Bridge. The article that they read stated that the fireman's body was lost to quicksand and never recovered. Ever since that accident, a shrieking phantom is said to be spotted on this bridge every year on or near Thanksgiving.
I thought that going to college right out of high school was intimidating. I came from a small town, went to a huge college with an enrollment of over 50,000 students. It was crazy to me how active the campus was all the time. If I thought it was a culture shock though, it was nothing compared to what happened during Thanksgiving break. Now I didn't have the kind of money to be able to go home so I remained in my dorm room alone during the break. I didn't realize that this also had me one of the few people not only alone in the dorm building but on the entire campus. What had so recently been just a metropolis of people became a barren wasteland. If the loneliness wasn't enough, a damn snowstorm hit the night before Thanksgiving. I recall waking up in the morning about 7 a.m. and looking out across a completely barren and desolate campus. Now I suppose this doesn't seem weird at all, but it was a complete shock to me. Honestly, I spent the entire day on Wednesday in my dorm room looking out over the campus. I didn't really even have the nerve to go out. However, I guess I began getting stir crazy on Thanksgiving. I got myself a frozen turkey dinner that I was going to make in my microwave, but I really wanted to get out. Now there was a Denny's on campus, so I thought I'd go there and have dinner. The dinner went fine, but I was uneasy because there was another guy in the restaurant who wouldn't stop staring at me. And I was like, what the fuck? It made me uncomfortable. I normally like to take my time in a restaurant, but couldn't bring myself to do that here. So immediately after I was done, I was up and out. Walking home, I nervously kept looking over my shoulder. It didn't take long before I noticed that the guy was following me. Holy shit. And he was walking faster than I was. By the time I got to the dormitory doorway, he was already up the front steps. He called for me to hold the door for him, but I didn't. He seemed pretty old for a person living in the dorms, but if he was a student, he'd have an electronic key card to let him in. I looked back as I went up the stairs and saw him standing in the foyer. Now, I'm not sure how much later it was, but I heard a knocking on my door. I got up and looked out the peephole and was surprised to see the man from outside standing in front of my door. I wasn't quite sure how he'd gotten in, nor how he found my room. Rather than acknowledge him, however, I went back to my desk quietly. He knocked a few more times and then left. About five hours later, I heard another knock at the door. At first, I of course expected it to be that man again. However, when I looked at the peephole, it was the campus police, and I let them in. One of the other students that was in my dorm building had gotten attacked earlier in the day, and they wanted to know if I'd seen anything suspicious. I explained my experience to them. They had arrested a suspect, and I had to go with them to see if I could identify the person. It indeed was the man who had followed me home from Denny's. He apparently had gone door-to-door -door knocking and hadn't known where I was. He eventually came across someone who opened their door and the person who did paid a terrible, terrible price. You're listening to the Blackwater Media Radio Network, the finest in digital audio entertainment. This is Blackwater Media coming to you from the great city of Atlanta. Every Thanksgiving, twin brothers Bill and Frank Watson used to hear a ghost story from their grandfather. A former railroad worker, their grandpa would retell this spooky story of a place known as 
Duffy's Cut, located in Pennsylvania. In 1909, a man was walking home from a tavern. There he saw blue and green ghosts dancing in the mists on one September night. The Pennsylvania Railroad kept a record of this incident too. The man said, I saw with my own eyes the ghosts of the Irishman who died with the cholera a month ago, dancing around the big trench where they were buried. It's true, mister, and it was awful. Why, they looked as if they were kind of green and blue fire, and they were hopping and bobbing on their graves. I heard that the Irishmen were haunting the place because they were buried without the benefit of clergy. After their grandpa died, the Watson twins inherited his old railroad papers. Turns out their grandpa was the assistant to Martin Clement, the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. From there, they were shocked to find so many correspondences with the blue and green ghosts in the area. According to Frank, one of the correspondences said, X marks the spot. Basically, the twins believed that perhaps there was a mass burial ground created when the landfill was made. This area was also the site of the original railroad bridge. An old witch was dead, and his people buried him in a tree up among the branches in a grove that they used for a burial place. Sometime after this, in the winter, an Indian and his wife came along looking for a good place to spend the night. They saw the grove, went in, and built their cooking fire. When their supper was over, the woman looking up saw long, dark things hanging among the tree branches. What are they? she asked. They are only the dead of long ago, said her husband. I want to sleep. I don't like this at all. I think we'd better sit up all night, replied his wife. The man would not listen to her, but went to sleep. Soon the fire went out, and then she began to hear a gnawing sound like an animal with a bone. She sat still, very much scared, all night long. About dawn, she could stand it no longer, and reaching out tried to wake her husband, but she could not. She thought him sound asleep. The gnawing had stopped. When daylight came, she went to her husband and found him dead, with his left side gnawed away, and his heart gone. She turned and ran. At last she came to a lodge where there were some people. Here she told her story, but they would not believe it thinking that she had killed the man himself. They went with her to the place, however. There they found the man with his heart gone, lying under the burial tree with the dead witch right overhead. They took the body down and unwrapped it. The mouth and face were covered with fresh blood. There are so many things to give thanks for this holiday season. And the first just may be that there's a Kroger nearby. Kroger, where your celebrations begin. This is a weird story that happened to me back when I was a teenager. 
My grandparents had a really small farm located in a small hollow. It wasn't a commercial farm, just something they had to support themselves. However, when they got older and it was more difficult for them to maintain the farm, they quit using the barn. It just sort of sat there and was used as a storage area mainly. Every Thanksgiving and Christmas, we would go out to our grandparents' house. Now this story took place on Thanksgiving. I was 15 years old and that's the age where I began not enjoying hanging out with the adults in my family anymore. Suddenly, listening to the stories of when I was a kid or when my parents were kids was just not that entertaining anymore. We had Thanksgiving dinner early. It was about 2 p.m. Afterward, I was beginning to feel a bit antsy. I let my parents know that I was going to go and explore the hollow a bit. It had been a while since I had done so. I didn't even think of asking my younger brother and sister if they wanted to go. It was fine because honestly, I felt like being by myself. I knew that I really didn't have a lot of time to explore before it got dark. So I set out and made sure I knew how far I could go and still get back before the sun had gone down. I didn't do the greatest job of it though. If you've ever been out exploring the woods, you might probably know what I mean. You can easily get fascinated with the woods and the hills and lose track of time. It got very, very dark before I was anywhere close to being home. By the time I got to the farm, it had been dark for at least an hour. I'd never been out by the barn when it was dark outside. It looked incredibly creepy. Now being a teenage boy, I of course liked scary things. The thought then occurred to me that if the barn was creepy looking on the outside, it must be creepy as hell on the inside. And I decided to check it out. Now, getting into the barn was simple. My grandparents rarely locked the door of their house, much less about locking the barn. They lived in a really safe area where crime was pretty much unheard of. The barn did have one of those heavy wooden locks on it. There's a name for it, but I forget what it's called. I was surprised that I was able to get the door open at all. I figured that the hinges had to be nearly rusted shut. So as I mentioned, the barn was old. And even when it was in use, my grandparents would only have been in it during the day. So there was no light. Thank God that I lived in the era of smartphones though. Because I of course had a flashlight on my smartphone. I turned on the flashlight and just marveled at the creepiness. You know, if dark is creepy, then just a minor amount of light is that much creepier. I was fascinated by all the tools. So many sharp implements. Most of them were hanging up. However, there was a small hatchet lying on a workbench. It was discolored, and on closer inspection, I realized that it was coated in dry blood. Now, I don't know much about the slaughtering of animals, but I knew that my grandparents used to do it often, chickens, pigs, and stuff. So I figured that the hatchet was used for that purpose, and they never cleaned it. The barn had a loft that was filled with hay, so I decided to climb the ladder and check it out. When I was shining the light around, it reflected off something buried in the hay. I was wondering if it was another tool or something and decided to check it out. Going over to it, I began moving the hay and I screamed when the empty eye sockets of a long dead corpse were staring directly at me. I fell backwards and nearly fell off the loft. I quickly climbed down the ladder and ran out of the barn without closing the door. I rushed into the house and told my parents and grandparents about what I'd seen. My father, a huge man like Hulk Hogan sized, went out to confirm what I told him. My grandparents phoned the sheriff's office. The body had been in the loft for about three years. It had several hatchet wounds on it that the police told us were caused by the hatchet I'd seen on the bench. The hatchet I picked up. So not only had I found a dead body, but I held an actual murder weapon in my hand. That was truly disturbing to me. But it wasn't nearly as disturbing as the realization my grandparents had that they had lived in the house for three years without knowing a dead body was in the barn. No one was ever caught, and we to this day have no idea who killed that man, 
or why? One night on Cape Cod at Gayhead, a Mashpee woman and her children were alone in their wigwam. The children were sound asleep in their blankets, and their mother sat knitting beside her central fire pit. As customary, her door flap was wide open. Suddenly she became aware of someone approaching her doorway and went to see who it might be. A sailor stood outside, and she asked him, what do you want? He replied. I'd like to come inside and warm myself by your fire, because my clothes are wet, and I feel chilled to the bone. She invited him inside and offered a place for him to sit beside the fire to dry out and warm himself. She placed another log on her fire, then resumed her knitting. As she watched the fire, she noticed that she could see the fire right through the sailor's legs which was stretched out between her and the fire, as if he were a ghost. Her fear of him increased, but since she was a brave woman, she kept on with her knitting while keeping a suspicious eye toward the sailor. Finally, the sailor turned to the Indian woman and said, Do you want any money? Her first thought was not to answer his question. And then he repeated, Do you want any money? She replied, yes. The sailor explained, if you really want a large amount of money, all you have to do is go outdoors behind your wigwam. Beside a rock, you will find there buried a kettle full of money. I thank you for your hospitality. Good night. And he went away. The Mashpee woman did not go outdoors immediately, as she wanted to think about the sailor's proposal. She sat and knitted and thought for a while longer. Still, she felt frightened from the evening's experience and was reluctant to leave her wigwam. More knitting time elapsed. And then she thought, I might as well go out and see if the sailor spoke the truth, to see if there really is a kettle of money out there. She took her hoe and went outside to the back of her wigwam and easily saw the place described by the sailor. She began to dig with her hoe. She realized that every time she struck her hoe into the ground, she heard her children cry out loudly, as if in great pain. She rushed indoors to see what was their trouble. But they were soundly sleeping in their blankets. Again and again, she dug with her hoe. Each time her children cried out loudly to her. Each time she rushed in to comfort them, only to find them soundly asleep as she'd left them. After these episodes had occurred several times, the mother decided to give up digging for the night. She thought she would try again early next morning, after bright daylight, and her children were awake. Morning came, but she wondered if she'd only dreamed last night's happenings. Her children were eating their breakfast when she went out to the digging place, and there was her hoe standing where she'd left it. But she could see that someone else had been there in the meantime, and it finished digging while she slept. Before her, she saw a big round hole. She knew someone had dug up the hidden treasure. She was too late for the pot of gold promised by the ghostly sailor. But again, she thought and wondered, but was I really too late? Again, she thought, that sailor may have been the evil spirit in disguise, or even a ghost. Perhaps he was tempting me to see whether I cared more for my children or more for the gold. Nevertheless, the Mashpee woman and her children continued to live in their village for a long, long time, even without the benefit of the ghost's kettle of gold. Have you ever heard of a place called Dudley Town? If not, indulge me for just a few minutes while I tell you a little something about it. 
Like much of Connecticut, settlers came to the area around what is now the quiet little town of Cornwall in the mid-18th century. And that includes the first Dudleys who came from England to the Litchfield Hills in 1747. They helped create what became a thriving community known then as Owlsbury, primarily fueled through the region's growing iron industry. Homes were built, the land was farmed, iron was forged, and the town grew and prospered, and all was well, or so it seemed. Some attributed the demise of the town to multiple mundane factors, the depletion of the farmland, the decline of the area's iron industry, the natural progression of younger Americans heading west to settle new lands, etc. Of course, there are others who simply believe the Dudley clan was cursed, as an inordinate number of Dudley supposedly came to untimely ends, and that the troubles extended to the village they helped found. Whatever the cause, mundane or monstrous, the Dudleys died off and the settlement's population continued to dwindle until about the turn of the 20th century. Finally, the last resident gave up and abandoned what was left of the town. The surrounding forest slowly swallowed up the homes and buildings, and today, the only remnants of what had been are a few crumbling foundations and empty cellars. But what about this curse? The story goes that anyone who's tried to live in what had been Dudley Town has come into some terrible misfortune. Over the years, there has allegedly been everything from suicides to demonic possessions, and almost every kind of dark manifestation to speak of. It's become home to all sorts of alleged paranormal experiences, with visitors witnessing all manner of spirit and phantom, as well as having unsettled feelings of dread and fear. As you might expect, the area has also drawn the attention of those enthralled with dark forces and demonic rituals plus a healthy number of amateur ghost hunters and teenagers simply searching for something to get into. Today, the remnants of the town sit on private property and is closed to visitors. It's just as well, too. For who among you possess the courage to venture into the village of the damned? And by the way, as you gather with friends and family during this season, remember to have a haunted Thanksgiving. I wanted to add my own personal entry into this year's round of A Haunted Thanksgiving Stories. From the time I was a baby, we always spent Thanksgiving down in Waycross, Georgia, with my maternal grandmother, who we called Mama Lonnie. Oh, I should also mention that my great-grandmother lived right next door to Mama Lonnie. She's really at the heart of this story. Every year, we packed up the car and drove 250 miles south to Waycross. I remember what at the time seemed like long stretches of endless highway, the farms, the endless rows of trees, and the roadside diners where you might expect the typical fare of Coca-Cola, fried chicken, coffee, or hamburgers. There's a lot of memories about those days that I could share with you, and maybe I'll share more when the opportunity to tell another story happens along. But suffice it to say, it was a small, quiet town where dirt roads and enormous backyard oil tanks were common. And in the late November air, you could usually detect the sound of a distant train and the scent of burning leaves. My great-grandmother's backyard ran for about 50 feet from her back porch. Immediately beyond that, there was a thicket of rotten lumber, hundreds of discarded bricks, rusted metal, all swarmed over with weeds, fallen branches, and crumbling leaves. It was a long abandoned construction project of some sort. Someone might have told me what it was originally planned to be, but if they did, I've long since forgotten. As a child, it frightened me. I don't remember ever getting within 10 feet of the area. I always wondered what might be creeping around out there, especially at night. 
It didn't help that Mama Lonnie said that it was crawling with snakes, spiders, and big rats. But it was my great-grandmother who told me something that chilled my blood. She said that at night during the autumn months, and just after midnight, that a Hutch Kuchopko crept around back there. I said, a what? And she said it again, a Hutch Kuchopko. She said that the white folks called it long ears. She said it was in the shape of a huge gray wolf with a tail like a horse. She said it gave off a terrible odor, carried every disease imaginable, and haunted desolate places. Now the truth is I never saw it, and I'm glad. It's funny too because over the years I rarely thought about what she said, but I never forgot that eerie little patch of land. Did an evil wolf-like entity move in the shadows back there while we slept soundly? Perhaps. I'll always wonder. It all happened years ago. My great-grandmother died in 1990. Mama Lani in 2000. So I haven't been back to Waycross in over 20 years, and I doubt if I'll ever see that place again. All of the people from there that were near and dear to me are now long gone. And that which tied me to those sights and sounds, the scents, the joys, and the fears, are no more. And oh yes, as you gather together with friends and loved ones, please, have a haunted Thanksgiving. Love and kisses, that's what a girl gets when she roasts her turkey the Reynolds Wrap way. Directions are on the heavy duty package. First, line your roasting pan with Reynolds Wrap to catch the juices. See how it molds tight and firm? So strong, so tear resistant. Now tint the turkey with Reynolds Wrap to keep the bird deliciously moist. Beautiful. Reynolds Wrap, oven tempered for flexible strength. Reynolds Wrap. I lost my job last year and things have been tight. My wife works though, so we've been relying on her salary. I took over cooking and housework things as I'm home all day now. I'm looking for work, but I'm down to applying to fast food places and they don't seem to want people my age. Some days it all feels quite desperate and out of control. I do quite well with budgeting for most bills but I've had to do a lot of stretching for food on our new lower income. You know what I mean. Lots of cheap pasta dishes and buying up veggies on special offer that need to be cooked immediately. Just in terms of price, a lot of protein is totally out of our reach right now. Sometimes I can manage cheap cuts of meat if I pick it up on the best before date, again, selling as a special offer. But those go fast at our local supermarket. Even the food banks have mostly pasta or canned foods. There are a lot of people in our situation, it seems. On top of all this, we really aren't as healthy as we used to be either. Recently, though, we've been doing better. It seems as though I might be able to set a nice table for Thanksgiving. Maybe not a roast turkey and all the trimmings, but my wife came home the other day with a big pack of ground meat so along with some potatoes and onions, I prepped a few dishes for Thanksgiving dinner. My wife even got kidneys for a pie. Thing is though, I can't figure out how she's doing it. Don't get me wrong, I'm not unappreciative, but I just don't know how she's able to afford it all. After all, her job at the mortuary really doesn't pay that well. Oh, and by the way, please, have a haunted Thanksgiving.
This incident happened to me when I was very young and it still chills me to the bone to this very day. My parents and my brother and I went down to Virginia to visit my aunt, uncle and cousins for Thanksgiving. Since my cousin's house was full of relatives, my family got the basement to sleep in. My brother and I both got cots to sleep on and my parents on the rollout couch. The basement was located on the lower level of the house, of course, and there were twin double glass doors covered by a thin white curtain at the back of the basement that led into the backyard. My brother's cot was the closest to these doors. One night I awoke and rolled over, wondering what had awakened me. For some reason, the backyard light was on, and I distinctly remembered hearing my aunt say that they would turn it off so that we could sleep. But why was it on in the first place? I glanced at my sleeping parents and then back at the light shining through the white curtain. And that's when I saw it. An enormous dark shadow was standing outside. I could only see the outline of it since the curtain was drawn. It had to be at least nine feet tall, and its arms, or wings were stretched out on either side, reaching at least five feet in length. And it just stood there. It didn't move, didn't do anything. Terrified, I yelled out, Dad, but to no avail. I looked at my father sleeping soundly on the bed next to me, and then my brother sleeping close to the double doors and the thing on the other side. Deciding to wake my brother instead, I scrambled out of the cot and went to move toward him, when I heard a strange scratching voice say, they can't hear you. I remember almost jumping completely out of my skin. To be addressed directly by an unknown entity is the scariest thing that can happen to you. I very quickly crawled back into my cot, tossed the covers over my head and began sobbing and shaking uncontrollably until I somehow finally fell back asleep. And the thing was still outside in the light when I fell asleep, by the way. Next morning, I told my parents what happened, and they just laughed, saying it was probably just a nightmare. I know what I saw, though. I can still remember what it felt like to touch the freezing cold basement floor with my bare feet. Later in the day, something weird happened. I overheard my grandmother on the phone with someone. I didn't catch everything she was saying, but I did catch a certain sentence, which was, well, maybe that's what Lindsay saw outside the double doors last night. I ran upstairs and asked my parents why they told everyone what I saw, and they both looked at me and insisted they didn't tell anyone because they were certain I just had a bad dream. So naturally I confronted my grandmother and asked her about what she said on the phone, and she looked at me blankly and said that she hadn't been talking to anyone on the phone, that she'd been in the kitchen the entire day helping with the preparation of the turkey. My aunt even vouched for her. To this day, I'm mystified about what happened to me that Thanksgiving all those years ago. I know it wasn't a dream. And what would have happened had I thrown back the curtain to reveal what the shadow creature was on the other side? But to each and every one of you, I wish a haunted Thanksgiving. My mother once worked in a daycare that had taken over the wing of an old school, and the building is notoriously haunted with the ghost of the school's namesake and founder, Colonel Walker. The attic of the building was used as storage for the daycare. Many people reported small, fairly unobtrusive events while being up there. Things like boxes shifting around behind you, drawers opening on the other side of the room while you were there, and curtains suddenly moving and the feeling of someone else being in the attic with you. But the kids were the most in tune with it. I know lots of kids talked about the quote old man at the daycare, which was staffed entirely by women. And I've definitely seen kids react all at once looking to the door as if someone entered the room when no one had. Personally, 
I always felt as if someone was walking directly behind me whenever I had to go from one end of the hallway to another. And sometimes I would hang out in the kitchen waiting for my mom to finish up work for the day while I finished my homework or something. I often felt like someone was there with me. I spent a lot of time there, especially in the summer when school was out, helping around the daycare. The most famous piece of evidence of Colonel Walker's ghost was a picture taken at Thanksgiving of all the kids with a big Happy Thanksgiving sign that they'd all made. Right in the back, standing behind the children and looking straight at the camera, is the watery and somewhat blurred face and upper body of an older man. Like you don't even have to squint or tilt your head to make out that it's there. Now I know some dumbass social media debunker will suggest that it could have been some bleed from some other photos or something like that. No, no, and no again. Plus, given all the other evidence, I just think they got the old colonel on camera. So, that's the story. Pretty damn creepy. Anyway, it's that time of year. So I'd like to wish everyone a haunted Thanksgiving. a total of $300 of my ShopRite register tapes between October 14th and November 21st, I can get a ShopRite grade 8 turkey free. Whoa! <laughs> yes, when you shop at ShopRite between October 14th and November 21st, save your register tapes in our save a tape envelope. $300 for a free 10 to 12 pound and $500 for an 18 to 20 pound. A free Thanksgiving turkey. Thanks, ShopRite. <laughs> The Navajo believed that death could be a dangerous business. According to the legend of the Chindi, a person's dying breath could contain everything bad or out of harmony about them, and it could become a ghost made of their worst traits. As this Native American ghost story goes, once set loose, the Chindi is said to cause serious harm to the living. After all, they're filled with the most desperate and dire human characteristics like hatred, jealousy, and greed. They can inflict ghost sickness which causes hallucinations and death on anyone who crosses their path. Navajo legend maintains that destroying the deceased's belongings or refusing to say their name could prevent the Chindi from causing serious harm. Alternatively, they tried to ensure that people died outdoors. That way the vengeful spirit could never disappear in the wind, usually in the form of a dust devil. If the whirlwind spun counterclockwise, that meant the person who died had a great number of evil habits. Some Navajo people also allegedly employed ghost bees to fend off vengeful chindi spirits. These were often hollowed out berries or turquoise strung together. But of course the Navajo couldn't always control where someone died. If a tribal member died indoors, usually in a Navajo dwelling called a Hogan, then the living had few options. The Chindi now allegedly controlled the residents, so the living abandoned it. Some people, however, were said to have used the chindi for their own evil devices. Navajo medicine men could allegedly summon a chindi to attack someone who had wronged them. Other myths claim that the Navajo witches could poison someone with ghost sickness by taking a piece of the corpse and making it into a bead or powder and then slipping it into someone's food. Given that in modern times, most deaths occur indoors, there's no telling how many chindi could be running amok. As you consider that, and all of the horror associated with it, remember to have a haunted Thanksgiving.
With a fresh kill in tow, the hunter made his way back to camp through a snow-covered forest. The weight of the stag labored his every step. A cold snap hit. Sharp, biting winds whipped icy particles through the night air. The sudden blizzard obscured his vision. The stars, which might have been used for navigation, were now cloaked by the swirling mass of snow. The hunter marched onward, becoming rapidly disoriented. White dunes rose up all around. Freshly fallen snow covered the tracks only several paces behind. He was now hopelessly lost, caught in unfamiliar terrain transformed by the northern squall. Something in the dark, snow-laden forest continued to press its will against him. The sharp cold stung the exposed skin on his face, piercing deeply and chilling him to the core. He tried to remain calm, trudging forward through the deep snow. Survivors remained calm, and so he would do his best to battle the encroaching panic. He must focus, survive, there would be shelter nearby. People lived in the area. His mind turned to the townsfolk he had spoken with. For the first time this night he recalled the myth of the Wendigo. He had been warned by the locals about the malevolent spirits that sucked the souls from men in these forests and left their frozen corpses buried under the snow. And while he told himself he did not believe such stories, he could not help but feel he was being watched. Not just watched, hunted. In the distance, a rectangular shape stood out from the backdrop of trees. A cabin came into view. He approached the front door. There was no light within. He knocked with a solid fist, fingers numb from biting the air. There was no response. He twisted the knob, finding it unlocked. He pushed and the door swung open. Wind rushed into the cabin and snow tumbled through the open door. The hunter followed, leaving his frozen stag and closing the door behind him. The wind continued to howl outside. It was not much warmer within the cabin, but he was free from the stabbing winds. Inside it was dark and uninhabited. His eyes strained to see, and he could make out little more than outlines. There was a bed, beside it a desk and a chair. On the desk, a lantern a rug on the floor, a fireplace, but no wood to burn. He made his way to the bedside and lit the lantern on the desk. Flames flickered about, producing only a little light and causing shadows to dance around the cabin. The walls he could now just barely see were adorned with grotesque portraits. Among the figures he saw misshapen heads, jagged antlers, long crooked teeth, unsightly growths, deranged eyes, and contorted expressions. The eyes brighter than the other shapes unnervingly followed him. Darkness played tricks with his mind in the dim flickering light of the lantern. He crawled under the blankets in bed and wrapped himself tightly there. He closed his eyes and tried to put his mind away from the disturbing portraits that surrounded him. He shivered under the blankets, which had not yet begun to warm him. Strong gusts blew branches against the cabin with incessant thudding and scraping noises. The storm grew stronger outside and the unlocked cabin door blew open with a powerful flurry of wind. Cold and snow swirled in. The hunter jumped up from the bed and slammed the door shut, this time locking the bolt. His eyes had adjusted to the darkness of the cabin. He saw to his horror, there were no portraits on the walls but only windows. The gruesome faces had disappeared from behind them. Something skittered across the floor. In one dark corner of the cabin sat a long and lumpy silhouette. Who's there? The hunter shouted, as if the demons that haunted this place would respond to his voice. He snatched up the lantern and lifted it in front of him, casting its light into the corner. Nothing was there. He scanned the room, shining the light in all directions, and found the cabin empty. Having satisfied himself that he was imagining things, he rested the lantern back on the desk. As his heart settled, 
he became aware again of the deathly cold. He crawled back under the promised protection of the blanket. Wind-blown branches continued to scratch and knock against the cabin. The howls continued outside. The storm was like a wild creature, struggling to get inside the cabin, scratching, knocking. The hunter lay for a long time watching the dance of shadows, listening to the sounds of the encapsulating blizzard, believing the worst was behind him. He finally closed his eyes. He felt a tugging on the blanket from the foot of the bed. His covering was being pulled off by something from below. Frozen in fear, he watched as the fabric slowly slid off his body, disappearing under the bed. The pillow then began to slide out from under his head. This too was pulled down below. He lay now in the middle of the bare white mattress, paralyzed by fear. He watched in terror as the pair of corpse-like hands with long pointy fingers slowly rose up from under the bed, reaching towards him. He tried to move, but his muscles didn't respond. His mind panicked. More shriveled hands reached up, grasping toward him. They clutched tightly at his limbs and torso. Ice cold spread through his body where the specters touched. He opened his mouth as if to scream, but no sound escaped. The apparitions pulled him straight down into the mattress, the material giving way as he sank below. It was cold and soft. The mattress was gone. He now found it was replaced by a deep mound of snow. The cabin, too, and the things within had vanished. He was outside in the cold of the forest. He could see stars above briefly before he was pulled fully below. Snow covered his eyes and filled his mouth. The hunter was found dead there several weeks later, lying next to the frozen corpse of a stag. It was reported that he had succumbed to the cold. His body was laid to rest, but the town folks say that his soul forever remains with the Wendigo. outside with the rest of the kids. This is where Thanksgiving really begins, isn't it, Edgar? Mm. Well, now, if you're referring to the aroma of roast turkey, I concur. No, no, Ray, I was talking about the kitchen. It looks like a real center of hospitality. Did you say hospitality? Uh-huh. That's one thing we're always prepared for around here. Help yourself. Ooh. Wouldn't this be a good time for you and your guests to have Coca-Cola, too? Yes, and Coca-Cola is so delicious, so refreshing, so tempting to any guest when you bring out those familiar bottles with tiny beads of moisture running down their frosty sides, assuring you that the Coke inside is really ice cold. And the good, the gracious, the friendly homes of America are always prepared for hospitality, not only on Thanksgiving Day, but every day, all the year around, no matter who comes to call or who happens to drop in. And one of the easiest, simplest, and surest ways in the world to be prepared for hospitality is to have plenty of Coca-Cola in your refrigerator, ice cold and ready to serve all the time. It's a wonderful way to say to folks, so glad you came. Welcome anytime. For the pilgrims, the winter of 1620 was a nightmare. The Mayflower remained in New England with the colonists throughout that terrible first winter. Although the ship was cold, damp, and unheated, it did provide a defense against the harsh New England winter until houses could be completed ashore. Still, the extreme cold, lack of food, and illness led to the death of half the group, both passengers and crewmen. 
But there were other deaths. Deaths that were not included in the official records of the colony. These deaths were not from disease or starvation. It was murder. The victims would be found, sometimes in the surrounding woods, sometimes in a field, and they were mangled horribly with their throats torn out. At that point, there had been five victims. Some colonists accused the Indians. Others suspected a pack of wolves. Many had heard howls coming from the depths of the forest. So a hunting party was formed. The men went out, and during the hunt, three wolves were taken. And afterwards, most people assumed that it was all over. And they were wrong. Each month following that, there were more victims. Victims that were found beaten, torn, ripped and mutilated following the first night of the full moon. The killer was both fiendish and brazen, even smashing into dwellings as if it knew that its prey was powerless against it. After all, it was fast, cunning, and as strong as ten men. The records aren't clear on when it all ended. In fact, there's very little information about the whole gruesome matter at all. Obviously, it's not in the history books. Obviously, it's not part of the traditional storytelling of the so-called First Thanksgiving. But it did happen. There are a few indigenous people, a few elders, who have the knowledge of these events. A story of absolute terror passed down through the centuries. Think about it as you sit in front of a comforting fireplace on a cold November night. Think about it as you gather with friends and family for a great autumnal feast. Give it consideration as we move further into this holiday season. And if you possess the proper caution, care, and wisdom, you will know better than to venture too far from your door on nights of the full moon. Growing up, one of the cool things about the holiday season was that there was always a creepy element to it, especially at Thanksgiving. I've mentioned it before. I talked about it in another story that my mother is from Waycross, Georgia, which is extreme South Georgia, right up against the Okefenokee Swamp. And we always drove down there and spent four or five days for Thanksgiving. Now, yes, of course, I have fond memories of movies, football games, the scent of burning leaves. It was always a chance to reconnect with my past, my roots. People would drop by and reminisce and tell stories of times long gone. Inevitably, a ghost story would come up and my eyes would widen and my ears became super subspace antennas. At some point, I heard this word, hate, and I couldn't make heads or tails of it. I never heard the word at school or on TV or in a movie. I remember asking my great-grandmother what a haint was. And I can goddamn well assure you, I wasn't ready for the answer. She put her hand up to her librarian-type glasses and explained. A haint is a restless ghost who has not left the world but has remained behind to haunt the living with trickery that is often harmless but sometimes more menacing in nature. She said that they often frequented isolated, forgotten, desolate places, back roads, 
abandoned buildings and the deepest, darkest regions of the swamps. Shit, after that I couldn't get enough. Every year when we went down there, I would ask anybody if they knew any Hank stories, knowing full well that it would scare the hell out of me. I remember laying in bed thinking about those stories. You see, Waycross is a small town. It seemed like there were more goddamn train tracks than roads. And I imagined those evil specters lurking out there in the darkness, moving aimlessly in the cold November night. I learned later that the word haint was considered to be a corruption of the word haunt, and that this was a tradition that we brought with us from West Africa. Anyway, this was just a little something I wanted to share with you. And remember, as you gather together with friends and family, be sure to have a haunted Thanksgiving.